Hello, everybody. I'm Greg Robinson, the chief curator here at BIMA, and I'm with Carletta Carrington Wilson, artist from Seattle, and we're in the middle of the Breathe exhibition. This exhibition is in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and it deals with a lot of social justice issues, human rights, civil rights, and we have almost 20 artists that are addressing different topics of importance to them. So I'm going to step aside off the camera so Carletta can take her mask off and we can get to know her better. Thank you, Greg, for that introduction. I really appreciate being a part of Breathe and being in community with all of the other artists who are working, frankly, with the whole idea of what it means to breathe in not just the United States, but the world at this time. Carletta, I know you've described yourself as a decorative artist with a message. We had your gigantic installation, Letter to a Laundress, in our large artist book show called Open Sesame just a couple of years ago, and people were so intrigued by that, and there was so much history and message in it. What we're looking at here are seven pieces that are part of a larger series of 12. And I just want to acknowledge that these are the most conceptual works in our exhibition. When people come up to these, they're not exactly sure what they're looking at, and they really enjoy having more information, unlike some of the other works that are narrative, but maybe more recognizable from a distance. Another way I like to describe myself is in terms of text as textiles. I am using textiles as a sort of code, and at the core of that uh, idea is cotton. And the cotton that literally transformed the whole world. For me, it's almost like jazz. I'm riffing off of the idea of cotton, and so, the pieces come to me and I attempt to express an idea through the use of fiber to send messages. Because frankly, we are always sending messages by the clothing that we wear. It is by class. At a first glance, you know where someone is situated in a society by their fiber content is the best way to say it. That's very interesting. And Field Notes specifically is about communication among slaves in the fields, is that correct? Yes, yeah, so my work is also in terms of time situated in the mid to late 19th century, mid 20th century. And very important, these are the people who have survived enslavement. Of the people who have survived enslavement, more than 90% could not read or write. And so I was wondering, how could that be that you want to communicate with your loved ones? You can't even tell them where. First of all, they didn't even know where they were many of the times. They were just taken away. And so how, how does that happen? So I have read a lot of slave narratives. And one, there was a woman who looked at the sky and she said she took comfort in the fact that she and her loved one were looking at the same sky. The plantation was a site also of hierarchy. Now, you could have been in the big house. If you were in the big house, you would have maybe delivered letters, you've seen the children learning how to read, um, magazines, newspapers, you would catch uh, news of the day. And also, your language skills are gonna be different from the people who are in the field. This series, Field Notes, is cited in the field. And these people, it's not that they didn't know about books, know about language, literature. You know, some of them made their own pencils and made their own paper in attempt 
to become literate. So I was trying to imagine correspondence. So there are, there are 12 small collages, which are actually letters. The idea was to evoke seasons, that's by the color palette, or um, a particular kind of um, situation that someone might encounter in a field. The lines of these correspondence are twisted and knotted lines of paper. And they are all signed with an X, which is the universal sign of the illiterate people. For a long time, I had my own titles, which never felt right. I just felt that they were kind of contrived. And then it finally occurred to me that I should go to the slave narratives. And so the titles are actual lines from the slave narratives. I didn't have to imagine what they were thinking. And the other thing I, I wondered, like, so how do you survive enslavement? I mean, it, it's just unthinkable. How do you survive this state in which you did not own your own body, not the breath in your body, not the children? How do you psychologically, emotionally endure not even knowing that you would finally be free, but in the hope that one day, at least your children and your generations would be free. And then I said, well, they cannot take away the rainbow. It is nature. I think because they were in the fields and anybody who's a gardener knows that you just see miracles all the time. You see beauty, you see life. And so that is why I just chose to make it dance with, or evocative to me, of what kind of plants, what kind of um, forms would surround this text. And in that way, I, I took solace in that, I have to say, because I wondered, I mean, when you really think about the juxtaposition between the big house and even the clothing that the people in the big house wore, and the, the clothing and the housing of the people who were in the fields. You just wonder, how do you get up every day and continue with that in mind? You are portraying a very complicated and horrific history in such a beautiful and tender way. There's a fragility in your work it's very poetic. I feel like I'm looking at poetry that's been stitched. Well, I tell you, the other side of it is like, uh, I like bling. <laughs> and uh, I, the other thing is, you know, I really couldn't make them images of despair. Because, again, I know if you are a sky watcher, there is beauty in the sky. You know, they often used to talk about you know, the birds fly free. You know, I, if I could fly away. I mean, so the animals, the insects, weather, all of these things served to assist them in survival. You mentioned working within a certain period of history. Your letter to a laundress installation truly addressed that. You had former slaves women doing laundry for other people, doing their own laundry, and also in business doing laundry. I, I really enjoy that spectrum that you bring forward. I'm wondering about taking the ideas within field notes, and if you bring these stories forward, what do you see today? Where are we today? Well, okay, so two things I want to say first. So for Letter of the Laundress, or letter to a laundress, there's a distinction between a laundress and a washerwoman. There's a class difference. Okay. One, a businesswoman seeing herself as a businesswoman, the other doing the laundry. They're doing the same job, except one goes to an employer's place. Okay. The other, the laundry is taken to her, 
there, but it has to do with class and money. But the thing is about today, you know, people used to say to me, why do you want to go back there? Meaning slavery. And I would say we never left. And I, I also mentioned this plantation landscape. And we never left. And because of the technology, we have the capacity to see what others had the privilege of not seeing. You don't have that privilege today. It is a very painful time. But I have to tell you, it can never be as painful as this. Because all we're doing is looking at it. We're not living it. But we see today people living in abject poverty in the midst of unimaginable wealth. It is the same story. It's just brought up centuries. So now here we are again. We have an opportunity. We have an opportunity not only to look but to begin to understand what has constructed our society. The base of that is cotton and how it changed the economics of the globe, the whole globe. We're still kind of stuck in the United States and we still are unreconciled with the South. But it wasn't just the South, it was the South and it was the North. It was Europe, it was Africa. It was Asia. All of this, this huge swath is roiling now. We've got the COVID on top of it. But the COVID is only one, actually small piece. The COVID is gonna go. But these divisions that society has wrought between people, that has to be really looked at and worked on. And so I just feel like this is my little part. It's a little part. They're just like little stories, but it is a place of entry. And we do have to enter that space. There are so many people as evidenced in the Breathe show who are working, who are working to tell some part of the story. You can enter the story anywhere, but we have to enter that story. And it is not a beautiful story. It's not fun. But the work of healing, as we all know, you scrape your knee, it hurts, it's very painful, but it heals up. And I think that's the work we have to do. We have to enter a very painful space. We have to look. We have to be honest enough to say, this is what has happened, but it can no longer happen. Because frankly, the whole world is at stake now. It is not, it doesn't matter how much money you have. Everybody's not going to Mars. So we have to figure out how we're going to figure this out. And that is, I think, the task. It is, I think, another first in human history. How are we going to heal the planet? But how are we going to heal ourselves? That's, that's what is put before us. And this is just a little piece of that, the little pretty part that gets you there, but behind it, a lot of ugliness. The work invites us to see history for what it was and today for what it is, and it forces us to have to step up and participate in change. And I really appreciate how you do that with grace and intent. Thank you very much, Carletta, for being part of the Breathe exhibition. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much. <laughs>